Good, uh, good afternoon. Um, resume the hearing. It's now the closing statement by the respondent. Dr. Conrad, please proceed. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I made a joke over the lunch break that I needed to refuel and I uh, thought that was funny. My colleagues thought that um, I should n not forget to include that I needed permission to restart and that was now kindly given by our president. <laughs> so what I will try to do in my closing is give you a, an overview of the hearing and then answer the questions that were very helpfully posed by the tribunal to the parties. So the structure of the closing follows your questions. What I will not do is, unlike claimants, I will not rehash the entire case of respondents and I will not um, rehash the arguments forwarded in the observations over the summer or the opening. Um, indeed, claimants have largely ignored the content of the hearing. We're trying not to do that. But what I will show you is the five points that I made at the beginning of my opening. And all of these points still stand. <laughs> Four out of the five claimants are German nationals. There's a secret sixth claimant that stands to benefit from any award of the tribunal. The nuclear fuel tax is not properly before you. And the measure was enacted in good faith and in the exercise of the right to regulate in order to protect the health of the people as mandated in our constitution and in response to the devastating Fukushima accident. And moreover, enacted in such a way that it didn't financially impact claimants. Indeed, Vattenfall is seeking compensation for its own business failures, uh, pla for plants that have been notorious for their failures and problems. I will now start with the overview of the hearing and also over the summer. Claimants' procedural conduct in this arbitration have aggravated and have emphasized the point I made that this is a case which should never have been brought in an exit arbitration. Indeed, their submission of 31st August 2016, the observations to the tribu a certain tribunal's questions, had to be redacted because claimants had tried to smuggle in two factual exhibits. The same is true for the second round um, of submissions over the summer. The responses to certain tribunal questions, 21st September 2015. Redacted was also Professor Tomowski's presentation, his so-called first summary presentation, because it contained elements that were not in his report and therefore violated the tribunal's procedural orders. And indeed, there was an exchange uh, between Ms. Richmond and Mr. Ranwald on the then amended Tomowski presentation. That's a transcript date 2, 36, line 5 to 12 in 2021. And Mr. Ranwald represented that there weren't any new points or arguments. That was proven to be false, as is shown by an exchange between Ms. Richmond and the president. Ms. Richmond said that's 36.5 to fine, um, sorry, 10 to 16 in this case, on page 762 of the transcript. Just one comment on that, Mr. President. I think the answer that we just received speaks for itself. This was not contained in his report. And the president said that the tribunal would draw the appropriate inferences from it. And next. At first, I have to say, in my career, with, a, um, with an experienced expert, uh, Mr. Kazmarek, who uh, claims to himself having had more than 100 exit arbitrations, suddenly didn't know what disclosures were and that you had to disclose also as an expert, not just as an arbitrator, conflicts of interest. That is 1064, lines 4 to 19. And because of the degree of outrageousness, uh, I would like to quote certain parts. And this is 1034, 19 to 21, 1035, 1 to 4. Question, tell me which, engagement, which engagements did you not disclose between the years 2008 and 2015? Which were those engagements? Answer, overall or in relation to Vattenfall. Question, Vattenfall. 
answer by Mr. Kazmarek, I was the appointed expert for Vattenfall in what we refer to as the Moorburg case. And then, in <laughs> a stunning revelation, that is in the uh, transcript 1023, lines 10 to 14. Question, Mr. Kazmarek, you just said you had a contract prohibiting you to disclose other present engagements for Vattenfall. Is that correct? Answer, correct. Then again, transcript 1046, lines 17 to 22, and 1047, lines 1 to 7 and 15 to 17. Question. You were just saying this request that you do not disclose prior engagements was made by Vattenfall to you. Answer, yes. And you, also, uh, you said you had a gag order also in your first Vattenfall engagement letter. Answer, yes. He was then questioned by the president of the tribunal. Transcript 1059, uh, lines 4 to 14. Question by the president. So that clause, is a, that a standard clause that you used in your terms and conditions <coughs> as navigant? Answer, no, it is not standard. Question, who proposed this clause? Answer, Vattenfall and all the lawyers working for Vattenfall proposed that. That is not a standard clause that we include. Question, was it drafted by your firm or somebody in your firm or on your behalf? Answer, I believe it would have been proposed by Vattenfall or its lawyers, 1059, lines four, 2 to 14. It goes on. Transcript 1060, 12 to 21. Question by the tribunal. Have you discussed that with the persons instructing you, that you to the effect that you might then come into a difficult situation, that you may run into conflict of interest and or you have to disclose this in certain proceedings? Answer by the witness, I have had conversations <laughs> with the client and the lawyers regarding this from time to time. It was always still their view that they wished us not to disclose our involvement. Transcript 1060, lines 12 to 21. Again, he was asked, <coughs> and that was by me, 10, 17, 16 to 21. So is it your statement that parties could, in an engagement letter, forbid you to disclose their, I mean, the prior relationships you had with them, not with third parties in an arbitration where you're an expert for them? Answer, yes. Well, any expert worth his salt or her salt should have either told the client, I will disclose, or I will not work for you under these conditions because my uh, duty as an expert is first and foremost to the tribunal and not to the party paying my fee. We had more things that were withdrawn or struck. The entire direct presentation of Professor Arndt was withdrawn after it was established that it exceeded the scope of the expert opinion. And you can see that at 1393, lines 7 to 14 of the transcript. Another one, and I'm debating with myself if it exceeds the Kasmaric issue or if it's uh, the sa on the same scale of magnitude. You will remember the letter, the famous letter of 26 September 2016 from claimants to the tribunal where they said, finally, claimants would like to notify the arbitral tribunal that Mr. Huckle has fallen seriously ill and is presently hospitalized. Mr. Huckle will make every effort to attend the hearing. His recovery process, however, is currently not foreseeable. When he then testified at 8.15, lines 15 to 21, he stated that the hospitalization was as much as four weeks ago. And he confirmed when asked by the president, no, I was hospitalized for four, I was hospitalized for four weeks ago and spent one week in the hospital, so three weeks ago I was released. And you can see on the next slide me vociferously objecting. That's 1815, 19, 20, uh, line 19 to 21, 
816 lines 4 to 17 and 817 lines 13 to 15. And there was <coughs> this exchange with the president, 817 line 19 to 818 line 3, and then 818 4 to 7 and 11 to 13. Present uh, question by the president. When did you advise claimants <coughs> counsel or claimants in general that you had been released from the hospital? Mr. Huckel, on the 30 23rd in the evening, on the same day he had been released, on the 23rd in the evening, I had a phone call with Dr. Leidinger, or he called me, and I told him I had been released two or three hours ago. Question by the president. When you, or it was that you were released from the hospital, what was your physical condition for recovery? Answer. From a medical point of view, I was healthy again. I was recovered. I had a few doctor's appointments still to go. Bear that in mind, 23 September. On 2nd October, so more than a week later, respondent was getting nervous whether or not it would receive final information about whether Mr. Huckle would testify or not, and made a request and also required that they would get a medical certificate on the health state of Mr. Huckle. And in response, three days later, again, not coming forward sua sponte, but only prompted by the request by respondent that they would require an official medical certificate, there was the answer on 5 October by claimant's counsel, claimants are happy to inform that Mr. Huckle has been released from the hospital and has confirmed his intention to travel to Washington and attend the hearing. We're now showing you a little timeline of this. He was released on 23 September. It was not until 5 October, nearly two weeks later, and after prompting and the requesting of an official medical certificate, that claimant said he was released. Even if we were to assume that there was some kind of miscommunication within the Luther law firm, and Dr. Leidinger may not have talked to Mr. Hupp, or there was something that fell between the cracks, that may perhaps explain the wrong statement, the misrepresentation of 26 September. What it does not explain is the long delay until 5 October. That pattern, that fact pattern, in my view, clearly confirms that the letter of 26 September was not an innocent misstatement because any ethical lawyer would then have corrected that misstatement as soon as it came to his attention rather than concealing by silence the fact that he had been released. The misrepresentations continued also through this hearing. You may remember that I read out Vattenfall's blog which described the hearing video feed as unbearable and at best mediocre. And that uh, the blog also stated that it had been Vattenfall in the interest of transparency that had agreed to the official publication of the videos uh, on <laughs> the first hearing day. Well, this is contrasted with Professor Hobert's statement of um, the second day of these proceedings, 595 lines 15 to 19, questioned by the tribunal. Okay, one question, it's a household question. We had asked also the claimants whether they would agree to the opening statement. Professor Hobert, the answer is no. We do not agree. You will remember that. And you will also remember this morning that I had requested a copy of the blog in time to be included in the closing submissions and made an application which the tribunal has granted we received a printout rather than an electronic copy so late in the day, just before the lunch break, 
so we could no, uh, not incorporate it. We, what you see therefore here is the slide that shows it's no that longer there as demonstrative. Mr. Hupp then said <coughs> during the hearing when he was, when the block was pointed out to Wartenfall, that 1749 lines 11 to 22 and 1751 to 7, that the block had been deleted, which is what you've just seen on the slide before by way of demonstrative. Also, the other claimants' experts were not poster children of cooperation with either the tribunal or uh, the process. And you can see snippets from Professor Stolzer's cross-examination, and that starts at transcript 1464 and goes on to 1456. Uh, um, and what you will find here is that um, quite uncommon for somebody who has testified often in arbitration, um, Professor Dolzer, as the president put it, did not want to, and that now is the quote, comply with the rules of the game. We have more of the same sort um, on slide 31, which is transcript 1480 to 1491. It is present throughout the Dolzer cross-examination. Then, and I'm very sad to make this because I have a very high personal opinion of Professor Schreuer, but he also failed to make necessary disclosures. This is a transcript 1582, lines 3 to 10. Question, did claimants remind you that you should disclose prior engagements for them in this arbitration? Answer by Professor Schreuer, I don't think so, I don't think so. Question, did tell uh, claimants tell you about procedural order number one, 1543, which exhorts experts to disclose their relationship with the parties? Answer by Professor Schreuer, not that I recall. If you then look to transcript 1579 to 1581, you will recall that I asked him specifically f about the first legal opinion he had given for <coughs> Vattenfall in the first so-called Moorburg case between the same parties involving Vattenfall AB and the Fe Federal Republic of Germany. And Professor Schreuer said, when confronted with it, answer, I do not recall having written such an opinion. And you will also remember I tried to refresh his memory by telling him that he was writing that on or about March 2010. Answer, hmm, I would have to check that. Otherwise, I can't respond to that. However, he does have a very vivid recollection of March 2010, which is exactly at the same time. Transcript 1581, lines 5 to 13. Question, maybe it refreshes your memory that that was at the time of the third Frankfurt investment arbitration moot and you spoke at the round table about disruptive procedural conduct in investment arbitration. Answer, uh, that you mean the guerrilla tactics table? Yes. Yes. Do you recall that? That panel, I recall. Frankly, <coughs> I, as an organizer of the moot, did not recall the exact topic on which Professor Schreuer was speaking, but um, had to look it up on Professor Schreuer's own website. Um, who lists the topic of this roundtable, which is a bit problematic since it is a, a Chatham House plus rule um, roundtable, or was at least at the time. That's transcript 1581, lines 5 to 13. I also asked him about the travaux préparatoires of the Energy Charter Treaty. That's transcript 1587, lines 15 to 19. And he answered, the travaux préparatoires to the Energy Charter Treaty are available only to states. <coughs> I then put it to him, that's transcript 1588, lines 6 to 15, but you are aware that Vattenfall AB's sole shareholder is the Kingdom of Sweden and thereby a state. Answer, actually, I did not know that, no. 
question, just to be clear, you did not know that Vattenfall is owned, Vattenfall AB is owned by the Swedish government, the Swedish state? Answer, no. At least, if I ever was told that, I have forgotten. But I'm not, now that you ask me, I'm not aware of that. I further asked him whether he was aware that claimants relied on the travaux préparatoires even before the document production in the 41.5 proceedings. And that exchange is a transcript 1588 lines 2 to 5. <coughs> and his answer was, no, I'm not aware of that. If I was trying to list all the misrepresentations also that claimants made this morning, for example, about the portfolio effect, which respondent had brought up as early as the counter memorial. Um, I don't think we would meet the 7.30 deadline, but we would have to go on uh, until the early morning hours, which is why therefore we'll flip to the questions particularly posed by the tribunal. Before you go on, <coughs> yes, sir. Uh, excuse me. I have some small house housekeeping matter. Yes. Could you give me a bundle that uh, where it is not broken? Because <laughs> <laughs> each time the flipping the pages oh. is, is a problem. I apologize for no, that no, mishap. Uh, if, if at all this copy was intended for claimants. No, okay. Brower seems to have the same. Uh, deep yep, okay. <laughs> well, Staples' quality is not as, uh, as good as it was, apparently. <coughs> Let's go to the investor and the investors and uh, the investment and the investments. Uh, so we're going to answer questions two and three together. What you see is the slide from our opening. And as new feature, we have highlighted the only foreign investor and only foreign claimant in this arbitration, Vattenfall AB, which is, as I said, a 100% state-owned company. It has a chain of subsidiaries in Germany, and you've heard our arguments that they were formerly under a control agreement with Vattenfall AB, which was then dissolved during the course of the arbitration. And through these subsidiaries, it holds shares in the OHGs, the three OHGs. And it is respondents' very firm view that the investment that Vattenfall AB and actually claimants collectively, and I will address 26.7 in a moment, only half are 66.67% in Brunsbüttel, 50% in Krümmel, and 20% in the Brockdorf OHG, which bears with it the contracting relationships between the OHGs and the parent companies by which the profits, the cash flows from the OHGs flow to its shareholders, which would be those shares. What is not an investment <coughs> is 100% of those plants, only the respective shares. Claimants have this morning pulled out the AES case, arguing that in that case the 99% shareholding, and they showed you a quote on their slide, which I believe was slide 25, if my count is not wrong. Uh, I'm not sure it was slide uh, 25, but they showed you AES. And that ni the 99% owned subsidiary was recognized as claimant for purposes of 25.2b of the exit convention. What they didn't tell you was that the tribunal in AES did not find any breach. Therefore, it had no chance to even come to the question whether 100% or just 99% reco were recoverable. They couldn't get to it. And therefore, the representation that Mr. Hub made this morning that 
AES without any uh, mention even accepted that you could claim for 100% is absolutely false. He also said that at transcript 2491 and line 5, it follows that he or his team had reviewed the list of ECT cases on the website and did not find any other cases involving locally incorporated claimants. On that, he's right. So there is no single case in which ever an exit, sorry, an ECT tribunal has assumed that a locally incorporated company could claim for any financial interests of a domestic partner. There is no single president, precedent for that. And indeed, what was transpiring from the opening, claimants themselves weren't quite sure what their investment and their investments were. And I recommend to you the um, transcript 43.17 to 21 and 45.8 to 46.1. They were referring back to Mr. Kazmarek and said they would come back to that in the closings. Now coming to 26.7. And the president highlighted at transcript 24.94 line four it follows, that claimant's case, because of the claims on through the OHGs, through the OHGs, which includes Eon interests, hiked the damages claim, as Judge Brower rightly pointed out, by nearly 100%. So what you see indeed, and we have established, and I think this is for once undisputed between the parties, that 26.7 of the ECT only applies to ICSID and ICSID AF arbitration, not to UNCITRAL, not to Stockholm Chamber arbitration. In claimant's case, this means that depending on the choice of the investor in which forum to litigate the case, the damages could vary between 2.7 billion in UNCITRAL or SEC and 4.5 billion in exit. That is certainly something that I don't think that the drafters of the Energy Charter Treaty had in mind. And to quote the often quoted Vienna Convention of the Law of Treaties, this leads to a result which is manifestly absurd and in our case and unreasonable. Respondent's case is far simpler. ICSID may have its advantages in the area of enforcement, in the area of annulment. It's a creature of treaty, but it is a procedural creature. It is a system of arbitration. The end result of having the same case applying either the ICSID convention or the UNCITRAL and SEC rules in terms of the amount of the award, in terms of the findings as to which standards have or have not been violated and as to the definition of what is an investor and an investment should be identical. And as, you know, following the exhortation of the Vienna Convention, we can look <coughs> at additional means of interpretation. But let's first start with the classics. Let's look at the wording. It's pretty clear it has an express scope of limitation to 252B for the purposes of 252B of the exit convention. It doesn't mention, it doesn't apply or alter the substantive provisions of part three of the ECT. The only thing it provides for is that an investor falling with its ambit has standing. And you can see that I've put out the text again, which shows that the reference is limited to jurisdiction for the purposes of Article 25.2b of the ICSID Convention. Also in its systematic position, it is positioned in the part dispute resolution, not in the substantial provisions, not in the definitions of <coughs> investor. And indeed, it makes sense as such 
because um, claimants have argued that we were to deprive 26.7 from any application. We don't. First of all, there may be a very good reason for an investor rather than to sue and arbitrate through the foreign parent to have its locally incorporated subsidiary argue in the arbitration. And indeed, this is what ha it happen it happens here. You have Mr. Metzentin here. All of the in-house lawyers for Wattenfall that are here today are Germans. So the case is conducted primarily by Wattenfall through their German legal department. 26.7 allows that. Secondly, there's also a substantive reason. Think of the umbrella clause. And as you're aware of, 10.1 has a rather wide definition with, uh, with an investor or an investment. Other treaties don't have that, or they have formulations like with regard to an investment. And there's always the dispute, can a parent company base an umbrella clause claim on a contract concluded between the subsidiary and the host state? And we've seen cases where arbitrators have said no. The combination of 10-1 with an investor or an investment and 26-7 avoids that <coughs> pitfall because if you have the two provisions read together and you have both the parent and the subsidiary in the exit arbitration, the <coughs> scope for a respondent to argue, well, this contract is with a non-party to this arbitration and therefore doesn't fall under the umbrella clause, is gone. So indeed, in respondent's case, there is a very valid ground for having 26.7 in the ECT. Let me look at the travaux preparatoire now. And you've heard Mr. Hub saying, well, that's not worth it. Uh, it was a multilateral negotiation. We don't know what happened. Well, we have, f first of all, um, it's them that try to argue that 26.7 should have a meaning beyond its Meaning, we don't. We just want to apply the meaning. So it should be, the burden of argument should be on them, not on us. But if you look, what happened was the original draft for 26.7 had a similar mechanism to what is in the Chile Argentina and, sorry, in the France Argentina and in the <coughs> Bolivia Chile bit, meaning it says shall be treated as an investor of the other contracting party. Arguably also this draft of the Energy Charter Treaty had already the limitation for the purposes of Article 25 2B. So the risk that this could be read as a definition of investor was already mitigated. But the German representative, and you see the footnote 17, and uh, for reference, that's exhibit R208. He said, <coughs> a reservation as an indigenous investor should not escape national jurisdiction via the charter mechanism. He made a warning there. And what followed was the wording treated as an investor of another contracting party does not appear in the final energy charter treaty. Prima facie, I would say, this is probably taking care of the German reservation in order to get Germany to agree. There may have been other reasons for that too, but what is important is that the wording treated as an investor of another contracting party, where one contracting to be contracting party had said, flag, warning, this could be misunderstood. This offending text is no longer in. And I've shown you this already in the opening, the comparison between 26.7 of the ECT and Article 1.2c of the France-Argentina BIT. And the definition of investor, as you know, 
in 1.7 of the Energy Charter Treaty has nothing about the foreign controlled local subsidiary. It just says organized in accordance with the law applicable in that contracting party. Whereas the France Argentina bit says le terme investisseur des signes, the term investor means or is defined as les personnes morales, juridical persons, effectivement contrôlés directement ou indirectement par des nationaux des lunes de parti, parti contractante, controlled directly or indirectly by nationals of one of the contracting parties. Here, it's the definition of investor. This is not the mechanism that the ECT employed. You will also remember the exchange I had with Professor Schreuer, transcript 1633, 17 to 22, and 1634, 1 to 5. And I said, before he makes comments on Quibarax, which he said he discovered only two weeks ago, he should perhaps read the treaty to put his reading of the award into the proper perspective. And the exchange that followed was 1634, 9 to 20, and 1635, 11 to 22. The president asked Professor Schreuer, do you agree with the description of Article 1 of the bid by Dr. Conrad? Witness, uh, sorry, Professor Schreuer is expert. Frankly, I do not think that the description of Article 1 of the bid in Kiborax is particularly rel relevant to the point I made. President, excuse me, this was not my question. My question is, do you agree with the description of the text of Article 1 by Dr. Conrad? Professor Schreuer, I would have to check the text. And then I qu again questioned him. Professor Schreuer, would you be surprised that in addition to a procedural clause referencing 25.2b, the Chile-Bolivia Treaty also includes the same mechanism as the France-Argentina bit? including the definition of investor, a locally con uh, incorporated company controlled by investors of the foreign party. Answer, I would not be surprised, no. Before you move on, um, can I uh, check that my understanding is right? Uh, and aside from the wording of 27, uh, 26.7, you're saying it makes sense in two contexts. One is that the lawyers for the local subsidiary can appear and present the case, but presumably that could happen anyway, uh, just by them turning up and defending the case. So that's not really a, uh, <coughs> anything of great weight. And the second is that uh, the local company can be regarded as a party to the proceedings in the event of certain defenses being raised in the context of an umbrella clause claim. Uh, are there any other instances where it might have effect, or is that it? There could be others. Um, the one that came to my mind, which I didn't want to mention uh, straight away, was because it could cast doubts as to whether that is conduct that the Energy Charter Treaty really wanted to condone, was that if the locally incorporated subsidiary is the party, the cost award, the adverse cost award against that claiming party would only affect the locally incorporated su subsidiary, but not the parent company. So uh, most respondents would obviously um, retort by a security for costs application. Right. There's another one um, that arguably you could say if you have a change of foreign control Let's suppose you have a foreign controlled subsidiary that is a party to the exit convention, which is com uh, controlled by the Swedish company A. The Swedish company A then sells its shares to the Indy subsidiary, to the Swedish company B, or even to the <laughs> Czech company C. <coughs> if you have just the subsidiary, which it remains to be foreign controlled by a member state, another contracting party of the Energy Charter Treaty, that could, and I'm speaking as a lawyer and I'm not speaking on behalf of my party for future possible arbitrations, that could have the effect 
that the claimant subsidiary, the local co uh, company, could continue to claim, whereas if the parent company is a claimant and sells its share to company B, there would be an objection raised. You are no longer holding the part, you are, you are the party, but you have sold it. And then you have the whole discussion about if you sell the investment after the commencement of the proceedings, is that just a crystallization of damages and so forth? Is there any sign anywhere in the Trevo Preparatoire of any of these questions having been in the minds of the uh, delegates to the drafting committee? I've not seen them. Um, I'm and I'm, I wasn't talking about the travaux préparatoires in this regard because our travaux préparatoires inquiry was on the wording of um, 26.7, uh, which excluded na the treated as investor part in its final form. You will also recall that during my discussions with Professor Dolzer and Professor Schreuer, I pointed out that 25.2b of the exit convention was originally conceived with investment contracts in mind and contractual exit arbitration because the exit convention obviously predates any treaties, any BITs with investor state and 25.2b enables contracts with the local subsidiary to be within the ambit of exit per se. If you also bear in mind that one of the strong proponents of the Energy Charter Treaty was the United States the United States has an issue with regard to the umbrella clause because their standard structure is not an umbrella clause that is substantive. It's not an elevation clause, so to speak, but it is a provision in the dispute resolution clause of US bids which make investment contracts directly subject to an investor state arbitration. So it's the contractual claim which is then in the treaty forum rather a contractual claim umbrellaed up by a, a substantive provision of the treaty, which is then as a treaty claim subject to investor state arbitration. So if you look at 10.1 and its concept of the umbrella clause, and if you look at the inclusion of 26.7, what, what I think I'm seeing is, completely irrespective of this arbitration, is traces both of the American tradition that conceives umbrella clause claims as procedural investment uh, contract claims that need to be dealt with in the dispute resolution clause and the continental European tradition of having a substantive law umbrella clause <laughs> which umbrellas up a contractual arrangement through and mirrors it into a treaty of provision which is then subject to jurisdiction as breach of the treaty. Now, the effect of that, and that is just to highlight, is that of the claims c put forward by claimants, a total of 1.810 billion would go to the benefit of E.ON. And to quote the reservation of the German delegate to the Energy Charter um, Treaty drafting, um, who said indigenous investors should not escape national jurisdiction. Well, this is exactly what would be the one. Let me now come to question 4B. Please expand on the relationships between 26.7 of the ECT and 25.2B of the in, uh, Exit Convention and the difference between claimants 2 and 3 as opposed to 4 and 5. <coughs> and if we could look at the um, at the uh, demonstrative again. There is a marked difference. Whether or not, through the abolition of the control agreement, Vattenfall AB lost control of the GmbH, Vattenfall GmbH and the Vattenfall Europe Nuclear Energy GmbH, uh, GmbH is for purposes of damages irrelevant because even if they are parties, they would claim for the same claim as the AB, tax questions aside, and as you will well recall, Germany argues that any award 
of zero or euro would have to be paid to the AB and would then um, be subject to that tax regime. However, for four and five, it makes a marked difference and it would inflate the damages by nearly 100%. That is not what the treaty wants. <coughs> also, you've heard Mr. Hupp say this morning that in transcript 2464, also unincorporated JVs can be parties to treaty arbitration, even if they don't have legal personality. And he wasn't sure which case it was and thought it was maybe in Pregilo. There are two cases, Lizzie and Depenta, which show exactly the opposite. In Lizzie and Depenta, in the first arbitration, it was held that the tribunal did not have jurisdiction because an unincorporated consortium had started the arbitration. They had to start again, not as a JV, but as individual parties. There's another case, Consortium Economicus against the Czech Republic, an unincorporated <coughs> Swiss JV, which failed to establish its foreign nationality, the foreign nationality of its owners. The claim was, because of that failure, deemed to have been withdrawn and costs were awarded against the claimants. We then had the exchange about the nature of juridical persons. The OHGs are not juridical persons under German law. They are conduits to manage the collective interests of their shareholders, which is why they are tax transparent. They are allowed to sue and be sued in the national courts, but only as a, by way of practicality. And indeed, if you, if you studied law in Germany, you will have been through this and uh, were probably cr scratching and cracking your head because I used to call it as a student the reciprocal um, and analogous application of the concepts of the Council of Nikaya. You know, three persons, one God, the Gesamthand is the opposite, and no <coughs> normal person would understand it, quite frankly, dogmatically. But dogmatically, it's not a juridical person but a firm, as in name, a way of partners to conduct their business together without establishing a juridical person. However, for practic practical purposes, it can sue and be sued in the national courts. But Article 1.7 of the ECT doesn't refer to juridical persons. Uh, it refers <coughs> to uh, a company or other organization organized in accordance with the law applicable in the contracting party. Does that make a difference? The question is if you understand 1.7 as a renvoi to national law or as an autonomous um, definition <laughs> of what is an organization or a company. And from the text, we don't have any guidance. You will also recall that we did not dispute that an OHAGI per se could be a claimant in an exit arbitration. What we did very vociferously um, dispute are two things. One, that even if it is a claimant, it should be treated as a juridical person which is as such a claimant and can receive the proceeds of the award. But we saw it as a renvoi that if for practical purposes it is regarded as a party uh, which can sue and be sued, and that is a renvoi. Also, the financial consequences would be the sa could, uh, should be also the same, that it is treated as a conduit f to through to its partners. And the second point, which we've um, which we've uh, laid great emphasis on is the question of control, which I would now address. The seminal commentary, probably most people call it, uh, Professor Schroer's commentary at 851 uh, refers to the, um, to the background of the drafting 
of the ICSID Convention. And it was stated there that a minority holding, even a minority holding of as little as 25 or even 15 percent might amount to control through a capacity to block major changes or otherwise. Let's apply that principle. You will remember that I guided Professor Schreuer through the Articles of Association of the Krummel OHG. And it is quite clear that any decision of any value, not just major decision, but also decisions that in the context of a nuclear power plant would be considered everyday business, amounts to more than just 250,000 are subject to a decision by the shareholder meeting. And the shareholders have to decide unanimously. The reason for that is first, that's the law. Second, there is no provision in the Articles of uh, Association which provide for majority decision. And you can see that if you compare uh, Krümmel, which is C8, with C7 for Brunsbüttel. In Brunsbüttel, you also have the very low 250,000 threshold, but you have also, and this is the two-thirds Vattenfall, one-third Eon um, shareholding, you have in Section 12.4 of the Articles of Association a staged proceeding of what is what can be uh, decided by simple majority and what requires unanimity. And you find that if you apply the block major changes approach, then even in Brunsbüttel, for major changes, you need unanimity. And it says, in addition, the following require unanimity. F first of all, um, Resolutions by the shareholder meetings which contain amendments to the Articles of Association, which would be a major change, including increases in capital and calls for additional payments in accordance with Section 7, must be passed unanimously. That's a major change for which unanimity is required. And then also, they have other decisions which require unanimity, such as new branches take over of equity participation and renting out of business, of the business. Only for the rest, there's a simple majority. So applying the major changes tax, also for Brunsbüttel, it is by no means clear that Vattenfall controls it. And Vattenfall has the burden of proof for control, both for Krümmel and for Brunsbüttel. You will also recall that in the document requests, Germany asked for information on their, uh, the relations between Vattenfall and Eon, and we were not allowed to see what contractual or other agreements existed. You've heard the reference by Professor Schreuer to the secret shareholders agreement in Fraport. We were not allowed to see what is going on between Eon and Vattenfall, which for respondent is an important area to explore unless you decide on a burden of proof um, doctrine that Vattenfall simply had f has failed to meet the burden of proof. And I'm also putting you, uh, for you on the screen the statement of Professor Schreuer, that's 1605.428, where he said, in a situation where you have two equal shareholders, if you require unanimity, you would never have any control by either of the two shareholders. Yes, we agree with that. Moreover, in Vattenfall's case, the OHGs are supposed to be much better off with the 13th Amendment than without it. This is from the cross-examination of Mr. Katzmarek. 1089, 15 to 21, 1091 to 13. He said, the profits would be earned at the parent company level. Question, so in the but-for world, the OHGs would have never received billions of euro. True. I asked them what would happen in the case of a share deal. That's transcript 1091, 14 to 22, 1092, 1 to 17. 
And he confirmed that in the case of Krümmel, Vattenfall would only have received 50%. Question, and had they sold the shares themselves, the plants themselves, would E.ON have gotten 50% of the proceeds and Vattenfall have gotten 50% of the proceeds? Answer, for Krümmel, yes. I then asked him about an asset deal, which quite surprisingly for a valuation expert, he didn't know what it was um, and wiggled a bit, which prompted me to give him a very simple hypothetical of an asset deal of a partnership. If the two students from high school as a partner, which German law, by the way, would qualify as a partnership, um, even though not as an OHG because it's not commercial, had a joint car and both own in it 50%. And I asked him, if Mr. Kazmarek was in that situation, would you want your $50? And he said, yes, certainly, and quite rightly so. And that's, um, the quite rightly so is, of course, my submission. Uh, that's transcript 1093, 4 to 6, and 1095, 4 to 14. Let me turn to question five. <coughs> and that is the nuclear fuel tax. And you heard Mr. Hub this morning state that there's a chance of it being reintroduced. That's also, again, false. There was a proposal this morning of one opposition party that holds 10% of the seats in the German bun Bundestag that proposed an extension of the nuclear fuel tax. Another such proposal was made a few days ago by another opposition party with 10% in of the seats in the German Bundestag, and it was rejected. Uh, so much for Mr. Hub's statement of this morning. Now, Article 21.1 excludes all taxation measures as a general rule and has then very narrow exceptions for discriminatory measures and expropriatory measures. And therefore, no claims are allowed to be made on the basis of the nuclear fuel tax <coughs> law. And you've seen that Vattenfall presented, unlike respondent, experts on international law and the Energy Charter Treaty. But neither Professor Dolzer nor Professor Schreuer opined on Article 1 of the Energy Charter Treaty, which I find quite telling. 21. Oh, wait, the transcript says 1. I'm sorry, 21. Moreover, Article 21.5 of the Energy Charter Treaty provides for a specific provision which an investor has to abide by if he wants to raise an the issue under Article 13 to the extent it pertains to whether a tax constitutes an expropriation or whether a tax alleged to constitute an expropriation is discriminatory. And the consequence of not employing this mechanism <coughs> is that a six months delay could happen. But over the last four years, Vattenfall has never even started this process. They've also relied this morning on the umbrella clause. But the umbrella clause is not one of the exceptions mentioned in Article 21. And we would submit that the Energy Charter Treaty, with all of its flaws, would have been able to identify Article 10.1 in Article 21 if it had wanted to do so. It is a different matter if you call the PCA uh, the PCIA or if you forget um, to mention a substantive provision you wish to have included. Therefore, the omission of Article 10.1 in Article 21 of the Energy Charter Treaty has to be intentional. Moreover, the MFN carve-out can also not be used to overcome the tax exemption. The narrow exceptions in 21.3 do not allow an MFN of 
a BIT which provides for full treaty protection in the area of taxes. This would violate not only the express language but also the international law principle that each word in a treaty has a meaning and that it was put there on purpose. It would also destroy the carefully negotiated balance that is Article 21. And that is just, if you even look at Article 21, you see how much negotiation, how much drafting power went into it. Um, there's a general carve-out. There's an exception to that carve-out. There's an exception to the exception. That indicates to anybody who has ever seen treaty drafting live that the contracting parties were haggling and trying to figure out where they would come out. And that was the compromise they reached, which is very, very clear from Article 21. What, and I will come back to that point in a second, but this morning you also heard it being downplayed that um, this is an umbrella clause claim. It's not really a taxation matter. It's not really a tax claim. <laughs> Mr. Kazmarek gave you a very, very clear and honest um, opinion on that. 1180, 14 to 22, 1181, 10 to 1 to 10. And he said there, being asked by Professor Lowe, the imposition of the tax does also have a substantial effect. He knows this is a tax claim. But let's look at 21 again <coughs> and its convoluted drafting, which, as I said just a moment ago, <coughs> clearly um, points to the fact that the treaty-making powers were trying to reach a compromise in an area where there was no unanimity from the start either to include or exclude taxes. And Professor Lowe asked this morning at 2496 lines 20 at sec, what should the drafters, and I'm paraphrasing, what should the drafters of the ECT have done differently if they had wanted to exclude the arguments that, are, that claims are making now? And claimant's counsel said they had to come back to that and they didn't know. I have looked into it and I've, I've tried to figure out what would I say is a treaty making power, what could be clearer than Article 21? Provided that I had to reflect the, um, the balance and the deal that the contracting parties had made with exceptions and exceptions from the exception. And I could not come up with anything. The best I could up, uh, come up with would be a sentence. Footnote, the par contracting parties record their understanding that when we say nothing in this treaty shall create rights or pose obligations with respect to tax measures subject to the exceptions listed in Articles 21.3 and 21.7, we also mean to exclude clever lawyering and treaty shopping. Um, I don't think that outside EU negotiated um, treaty proposals you would find such sort of drafting because it, it would be highly unusual. But short of a, this is our understanding, please exclude also abuse tribunals and um, uh, I couldn't come up with anything else. Article 21, in my opinion, makes it very clear what the contracting party wa parties wanted, and that is certainly not for what it's used to um, by claimants. Claimants were also asked at transcript 2508 by the tribunal whether they were MFNing in an, an, uh, a dispute resolution clause. And the answer was not the dispute resolution clause, but all substantive provisions from other treaties that grant protection also to taxes. That's a two-pronged thing, because I agree it also 
MFN SIN dispute resolution clauses that also cover taxes because 26.1 of the Energy Charter Treaty says breaches of this treaty, violations of part three. So in addition to getting uh, rid and getting over 21, you also have to get over and expand 26. <laughs> um, what I would describe as creation of jurisdiction for taxes ex nihilo, um, since I've been religious already this afternoon, um, but it actually does violence to the tri uh, treaty. This is not a normal MFN situation. And we've all heard and were privy to, and we may agree or may not agree with the um, cases on MFN saying that they have to be in like situations or that while you may strip from a dispute <coughs> resolution clause certain, certain uh, limitations such as a requirement to go to national courts, etc., but that you cannot go beyond the scope and create jurisdiction where there was no jurisdiction. <coughs> Here, we have an attempt by claimants which goes even beyond that because it creates jurisdiction where there was no jurisdiction and protection where there was no protection against the explicit statement of the contracting parties. Even if you take a pro-MFN, pro-investor approach to MFN, this is a bridge too far. Um, the MFN bridge will not hold that, uh, that crossing. And um, on this chapter, I can conclude with a, uh, a graphic that you've seen almost four years ago. Um, and that shows, just in relation to the tie bit, which claimants have relied on, um, they're not trying to get the same treatment that a Thai investor in Germany would receive. <laughs> they are trying to create a super bit, a super bit of a sort that no contract, Germany never, contra that no contracting party of the ECT ever contemplated because they are cherry picking from this and there and everywhere rather than leveling up to the standard of treatment enjoyed by another investor under another BIT. It's one thing to say, we have a bit here, and we have a bit here, and we're leveling it up. But it's an, an MFN can arguably do that. But what we're indeed seeing is you're not just leveling up to the level of the other BIT, but you're leveling up and beyond that level. And that is something which is problematic. And you can continue the game at infinitum. So the other one, the bit on from which you pick the cherries, that investor will say, well, hang on, you've created the ACT plus my treaty to get a higher result. Now, I want the same. And they are leveling it up and tr uh, picking cherries from yet another treaty. And uh, you will have something which, as such, had never been concluded by the contracting parties. I will jump now from jurisdiction on the for tax cl um, claims to before I create a chaos, I will flip this through uh, to the energy production volumes in question six of the tribunal. And <coughs> you remember me saying that the OPVs, any the NEPVs, neither of them are investments qualifying under the Energy Charter Treaty. They are not assets under international law and they're not protected property rights under German law. Therefore, they cannot be expropriated separately. They are, as Professor Papp here um, explained in his direct testimony, they're not even assets. They are limitations which had already been in place of a property right, limitations that had been placed in 2002. And I understood Mr. Anderson this morning to make representations, well, we gave this up, and actually we would have had an expropriation claim when the 2002 um, atom consents was signed. Um, the 2002 phase-out law is net not 
subject of this arbitration. This was never argued. If this is an attempt to amend the claim, claimants should say so, and in which case we would obviously object because this is doing this on the last day of the merits hearing of after four years of arbitration is somewhat late in the day. And I have included here now uh, from page 30 of Professor Papier's um, legal opinion, and he said that the electricity production volumes are not independent, economically valuable legal positions that are protected as property under German constitutional law. <coughs> he said that again during his direct testimony, that's 23, 79, 20, and 21. The residual volumes are, upon my opinion, not independent property positions. And he explains that. That's 2382, 14 to 18. The Federal Constitutional Court only protects such property when they are property of an individual. That's when they are based on essential work of an individual. That sounds very much like legitimate, uh, like investment-backed uh, expectations, if you put it in the parlance of international law. And lastly, when they're also there to assure the existence of an individual. You've heard this morning during the opening, and that was a transcript 2474.14, and I quote, uh, before I quote, I would want to say that on our slide we have um, redacted the portions of numbers um, of the documents which were shown to Professor Papier um, on Wednesday because we understood that during his cross-examination, claimants pushed the button to exclude the public. So we wanted to avoid that the public be excluded from this part of the closing and therefore have redacted the uh, information which was evidently deemed confidential by claimants. Claimants did not push the button during their opening when at 2474 at line 14 they said, we have shown to you during the cross-examination of Professor Papier that the volumes can in practice can and in practice were transferred and sold for considerable sums of money and the parties considered them rights. So that sounds, their representation of their cross-examination, sounds as if they were actually asking questions and were getting answers. But what really transpired was that he was, uh, Professor Papier was made to read very little numbers, which I, I was surprised he could read because I, being several decades younger, had issues reading them. And you can see that from my redirect examination, which was also cut by claimants from the public record. Question, Professor Papier, you were shown sheets with a lot of little numbers. Answer, yes. Question, are you an economist? Answer, no. Question, are you a professor of law? Answer, yes. And then no further questions. And indeed, I have to say, sitting there, uh, and I was, getting, uh, I was getting agitated because I found it tremendously unfair to have him just read out numbers into the record. <coughs> and I joked with my co-counsel, I bet now they will say no further questions. And that was indeed what claimants, what claimants did, which you will have seen me giggle uh, before I started my redirect. This was indeed the most absurd cross-examination I've ever seen in any arbitration, commercial or treaty. But Let what's your best explanation of why it is that a permission to produce electricity, which on your case is worth millions of euros and which can be sold to someone else, should not be counted as an asset? Not everything that has value is an investment for the purposes of um, investment-backed expectations and for the purposes of expropriation or FET. And also you could even um, draw a distinction between the definition of investment, any kind of asset under the Energy Charter Treaty, and the legitimate expectations, investment-backed expectations, that you need both for expropriation and for FET. Because 
when you say legitimate expectations, tribunals have rightly held that those must be investment-backed arbitrations, um, expectations. So, and we'll come to that later, in the context of the NEPVs, no investments were made in reliance. They were ephemeral um, windfall profits which were then taken from them. For the OEPVs, <coughs> I don't think the question is relevant because the legislator quite carefully in its exercise when deciding the phase out structured the phase out in a way that whatever the OOPVs were, they were taken into proper account. But what Professor Papier said on that topic was <coughs> that it wasn't investments which got them the OOPVs, but indeed they were the expression of the shutdown of the plants, a limitation of property. Had had a company introduced an exit arbitration on the basis of the 2002 phase-out law, and by the way, you remember Professor Papier told you that because the atom consent is not binding, um, such a, such a uh, constitutional complaint or an exit arbitration would not have been precluded by the statement of the energy companies in the context of the atom consent that they would not go to war for this. But that shows to you they weren't given them as property rights and assets to use, but they were already a limitation of property. And if a stage limitation um, is implemented, to turn that into an asset that's capable of the protections of the treaties, I, I I find that is, uh, and I, uh, Professor Papier has a certain dogmatic disquiet with that, and I have to say I share this disquiet. Um, but also for the OEPVs, also for the, for the OEPVs, they're not capable of expropriation. For the NEPVs, that's even clearer because they were given to them in the public interest of securing energy production and uh, a longer lead time for the exchange towards renewable energies. And lastly, assets, property. Property is something which is inherently defined by law. And that is what a treaty finds. And I believe uh, there are also decisions to the effect that if national law doesn't recognize an asset as a property right, it cannot be a property right for a treaty that's building on it, um, even though the concept of investment is an autonomous right a definition. Have I answered the question? I have a follow-up question, if I may. Yes. Um, without the uh, OEPVs granted to Krumo, and assuming now that Krumo still could could uh, operate. OEPVs or NEPVs? OEPVs. 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 Um, if it could technically operate, and also from the permitting point of view could operate, if it had no OEPVs, it could not produce. Isn't that it? is true. So It could purchase electricity volumes from, from other, other plants. Exactly. But, but that, uh, yeah. But part of its, of the, part or parcel of the, the, the pl this plant was that it had o OEPVs. Sorry, if you could repeat. Part, part of the NPP yeah. being Krumo, it had OEPVs. Yes. Without it, it could do nothing or go buy, buy from others. That is true. So if you take out, if you would, as a as 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 government or a state, would say, well, look, I now expropriate your plant. At least the pla only the plant. Only the plant. Only the plant. Um, what remains? You would be able to assign the OEPVs mm -hmm. and make value with it. And actually, that's at the core of respondents' case because claimants ascribe a value of zero mm -hmm. to these volumes, and we ascribe a value um, that is very high indeed to these. And I'll ask you the question for the purposes of, of, of seeing whether or not within the description or definition 
of expropriation in Article 13.1. Uh, this would be an expropriation. If you would say, I stop the plant, or expropriate the plant, or whatever you, you would call it, <laughs> but still the OPVs remain there, can you not call it an expropriation? First of all, I don't think you could call that a expropriation because of the, and that is also what Professor Papi has said, the OEPVs are part and parcel of the plant property. Yep. So a value containing part, or maybe the, even the main value containing part, would still remain with the owner. And therefore, mm -hmm. we would not exceed the threshold of a substantive deprivation um, for a taking under the Energy Charter Treaty. Let's make it a, a more, more uh, slightly more technical. The, the, the operating license is withdrawn. Yes. But not the OPVs. The operating is there, is there then an expropriation? Not at all, for a number of reasons. First of all, because the operating license is also not an asset. Mm -hmm. It is a public law uh, permit, which also is based on the fact of, say, reliability. And such permits are withdrawn every day in Germany, not for nuclear power plants, but for the, um, to use a Czech term, Kachma, uh, for a bar, uh, if there's a um, lack of reliability. That is not an expropriation, and that would actually be under the police powers doctrine that it, this is not an expropriation. We have a question on that later on. Mm -hmm. okay. Please uh, move on to question seven. Let me... T <coughs> Just. Um, at least I have hop hop uh, hopefully not offended David's ears and switched off that microphone quick enough. Question seven, as a factual matter, did the return to OEPVs after the 13th Amendment combined with fixed final shutdown dates of nuclear power plants and three, does clo uh, the closure of a number of nuclear power plants result in the OEPVs becoming valueless on 6th August 2011? Let me first dispel a myth from Clayman's opening. And I wasn't quite sure if this was the exchange of emails or memos that claimants referred to earlier during their opening. They showed you on slide 68 of their opening, exhibit C147, and they said this was evidence that the state knew that the OEPVs could never be used up. This is false because that document relates to a different draft of the law which was never implemented in practice. So it is, it is quite misleading to quote it in the context of the 13th Amendment. You also heard this morning that claimants argued that the Ministry of Environment didn't calculate the uh, effects of the shutdown dates. The opposite is true, and we've submitted the documents which evidences the calculations at, at SR141. And you've, you will remember from the opening, I showed you the excess production capability um, that was determined in, par in, par <coughs> in the run-up to the 13th Amendment. And that was criticized this morning by claimants because it used reference production volumes. The question was which else should they have used? Because the historical averages would have been distorted. <laughs> the, what we were observing in the run-up to the 2011 lifetime extension were that certain plants, first and foremost Brunsbüttel, were, let me put it this way, were taking it slowly, so they would still have OEPVs by the time the hoped-for lifetime extension would happen, so they would be included and could be shut down shortly after and the new volumes could be commercialized. Therefore, using real data at that time, at that time in 2011, would have be problematic because those would have been figures that were manipulated by the plant owners. 
Moreover, as you also recall from the opening, the 13th Amendment had a security margin of 16.181 terawatt. You will also recall from the opening that I explained to you why certain plants, in particular Krümmel and Brunsbüttel, had more residual volumes than the rest. And that was caused because of their own standstills. What claimants are trying to get in this arbitration is they are trying to be compensated for the fact that they had, through their own fault, more residual volumes than others. They, were, they want, in essence, financial compensation for the standstill times of the four years of the Krummel and the Brunswick plant. Moreover, there's also a slide evidencing that E.ON, the co-investor who, in accordance with Clayman's case, would enjoy a windfall profit of $1.8 billion, would be able to absorb the OEPVs of Vattenfall. It is, by the way, also not true that Vattenfall lost all of its plants, still um, continues to operate Brockdorf. And I showed you also in the opening slides evidencing that for each operator, except for E.ON, who lost four plants, no more than two plants per operator were shut down um, in the immediate aftermath of Fukushima. <coughs> I move now to question eight. Assuming that the OEPBs had value on 6 August, did they become valueless at a later date? And if so, what are the consequences? It is clear after the experts have all been heard that, of course, they have a value. And that value can, of course, be determined. And I will show you in a moment that Mr. Kazmarek um, in well, actually one of the later chapters, that Mr. Kazmarek's um, refusal to calculate the value is in stark contradiction to his own approach to the valuation of the plants themselves. He argues that because you could perhaps only sell the volumes in the future, they have no value today. On the other hand, when confronted with the, um, the statement that, well, on your valuation date, there was no buyer and no seller willing to buy a nuclear power plant for any amount of money after Fukushima. He said, well, but that's just on that date and later on somebody might want to buy. Um, he seemed not to feel that inherent contradiction. Also, if you look at the values attributed to it, there has to be a balance between a buyer and a seller. It's a meeting of minds, and therefore it would be unfair, as Mr. Kazmarek does, to attribute 100% of the benefits of the sale to the seller. If that's the case, nobody's going to buy. You have to have a, a balance between the interests of both, which determines the value. And Ms. Harden explained that at 8.424 and 8.421, um, and actually, I wanted to uh, reserve this for later, but I think this is a good point to uh, mention. Um, Mr. Hobert this morning argued uh, that Ms. Hardin's approach was, and he used game theory in a derogatory way. Um, the president, uh, I assume, whom he was referring to, did not use it in a derogatory way because I assume that the president, as I, know that the Swedish Academy of Science awarded in six years the Nobel Prize for Economy to game theorists. Indeed, in those six years, a total of 11 game theorists were crowned with the Nobel Prize. So game theory, th theory is a very, very serious and very, very um, smart theory, as the Swedish Academy of Science seems to agree with, because it takes a rational approach to the actions of market, uh, market participants in their transactions. And the balance that um, Ms. Harden projected 
that you have to balance the economic benefits between the buyer and the seller is exactly a, the outcome of the game theory because both market participants act rationally. Moreover, Vattenfall understates the Proctor of demand. You uh, will remember the question of the president in the opening to claimants, and that was page 162, lines 20 to 22. You just said that Brockdorf will run out of its production volumes in 2019. Could it then not buy production volumes from what is the other one, Krummel? Answer Professor Hobert. They are indeed, well, yes, that's a possibility, I suppose. I'm not quite sure right now how that has been factored in by Mr. Kazmarek in his calculations, so I think we will have to consult with him to come up with an answer, yes. <coughs> one would think that claimants would know their own case at the time of the opening. The other point is that this morning during the closing, the point was made, oh, what if, if uh, a year before the uh, hard shutdown date, you need to do a core refueling? That was an argument that was uh, coming up this morning by claimants. You will also remember that at the, uh, in the opening we saw a very long film, a promotional video by Vattenfall, and there was the statement that annually, together with the revision, a sixth of the fuel elements are routinely exchanged. So you will never have the situation that you will, at least according to Vattenfall's promotional video, that you, expl uh, that you have an know, completely depleted like a battery core and then you need to refuel all of the re uh, fuel elements. But what they explained their own practice is that you have one six per year. So this argument that this would obviate the Brockdorf demand for the years 2020 and 21. And I would now turn to question nine and <coughs> I trust David or the tribunal will tell me um, when to break after a question. Let's see what the, what the uh, number of minutes is that you have. <laughs> it's been one hour and 32 minutes. Does that include the tribunal's questions? That because I think that's from start to end and including tribunal questions and not pure. You're uh, right. There's please subtract five minutes for tri tribunal questions from that. I I have the name. that short. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's right. Eighty-seven minutes. So uh, you're not yet uh, at, at half of it. Good. Then I will continue. Yeah. Question nine. And that is the question about the soul effects and the police powers doctrine. As I said a few minutes ago, police powers is well established <coughs> in international law. Respondent has never disputed that. What we have said is you do not need it in our case because there's a threshold issue both for the so-called sole effects doctrine and the police powers doctrine and that is you have to have a taking. In the absence of a taking, both theories come to the conclusion there's no expropriation and you need not investigate further. It is obviously within the powers of this tribunal to decide that they wish to apply the police powers doctrine if they wish to do so. I'm now showing you a few slides to which I will not speak which I uh, but to which I spoke to in the opening all to the effect that the threshold for taking is a high one and requires a substantive deprivation, in fact some awards say annihilation of the value of the investment. <coughs> I also mentioned already during my closing the portfolio effect. 
claimants this morning were trying to say, well, the, it's the nuclear business and then they have some other businesses, <coughs> etc. That is not true. Vattenfall has an energy business, an electricity business. And although, and that was Mr. Andersson speaking to slide 62 of their closing pro um, presentation, 2586 line 6 at SEC, that it was not, and I quote, in his expertise to, to assess what the potential benefit of the 13th Amendment was. Well, we have spoken about the mechanism which provides for the potential positive effect throughout this case. It's called the merit order. And that also responds to a question that Professor Lowe had during Clayman's closing. What do you do if you keep criminal on the net? Do you have too much energy? Bear in mind, Vattenfall, and I showed you this figure during the opening, has 92% of conventional um, electricity production in Germany, which are on the merit order to the right side of nuclear energy. So if you put one nuclear plant more on the net, you push out, sorry, you bring up the merit order to the lower um, to the lower uh, cost nuclear plants, which means that the conventional plants, lignite, steam coal, gas, will not be benchmark setting. So if you have Krummel on the line, by effect of the merit order, Vattenfalls, lignite plants, or coal plant, uh, steam coal plants, depending on where demand is, would make less money. All electrici electricity production methods are interlinked. If you, and I said that in the opening, if you put your plug in the socket, your iPad doesn't care if it's renewable energy, coal, nuclear, or somebody on a bicycle producing um, electricity. It's all the same kind of current. Therefore, respondent had early on in the counter memorial pointed out that claimants bear the burden of proof of showing that in their submission there was no positive portfolio effect, that they as a whole suffered a loss or an impact. <coughs> they never did that. We're now at the end date of the oral hearing after four years of arbitration and they have not even started quantifying a portfolio effect. And now it is too late. <coughs> And I felt very vindicated because we had made the point about the portfolio effect and the merit order since the counter memorial when then Philip Morris came out which validated in paragraphs 283 and 284, Claimants Legal Authority 188, that in fact the portfolio effect was important. You will remember I also sh uh, showed you Chemtura um, at the Lindane case in the opening. I will, will not go through that again. In order to meet its burden of proof, Vattenfall would have had to demonstrate that the 13th Amendment caused a complete destruction or virtual analyzation of its overall electricity investment. And as I said, it's electricity production. You may produce it through lignite or nuclear, through steam coal or water. It is the same business. But they failed to submit any evidence. Indeed, they, when we asked for it during the, um, the document production re uh, phase, they refused to provide information on their portfolio. I would now come to question 10. <coughs> What is claimant's position on the expropriation with respect to the NEPV of the Brockdorf plant? See reply memorial 473. I have to say I don't recall that claimants spoke to this issue during the opening. If I have missed it, I apologize, but um, 
it seemed not to, they seemed not to have answered this question by the tribunal. And um, my response to that is simply, this is a question of the burden of proof and um, therefore claimant's problem. So that we can now come to question 11a. Accepting as a premise that respondent was entitled to change its nuclear policy so as to return to the OEPVs and to introduce fixed shutdown dates for each nuclear power plant, what should respondent have done differently according to claimants? For example, which plant should have shut been shut down instead of Brummel? If none, how would the shutdown schedule have been met? The comments of claimants on that question were very, 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 very short. This is slide 62 of their closing, the one I have referred to previously. They said no plants should be should, uh, shut down, um, but they didn't give any particulars about what length of shutdown dates would be required for Krummel, um, nothing on the schedule, and they refused, as I said, this was at 2586, line 6 at sec, to even discuss the merit order. The Germany would not have had a better choice than to shut down Krummel. And you will recall this table from my opening, which shows that all of the Line 69 boiling water reactors, Krummel and Brunsbüttel included, were shut down but not the newer ones of the 72 line. And you will remember that this prompted a army of experts to be sent into the field by Vattenfall, proving that the 69 plant was really a 72 plant because, because, and because. And respondent obviously responded to that, pointing out that in the relevant parts, um, it wasn't. And P Mr. Bantholz, who is the person who probably knows the Krummel plant best, an expert for respondent, was never called by claimants. They did not want to hear from him, probably because they didn't want to hear what he had to say. Then even if we look at the incidents, you also recall that slide, the next oldest plant would have been Grafen Rheinfeld, a pressured water reactor of the 72 line. We don't even have to talk about Brunsbüttel, which is the plant with the highest number of notifiable incidents amongst all German power plants. Krümmel is still almost 100 incidents worse than Grafen Rheinfeld which is, if you look at Grafen Rheinfeld, that's nearly 100, uh, it's nearly 50% worse. And o another way to look at it is, you also re remember those graphs from the opening, showing that Brunsbüttel and Krümmel fall well within the cohort of plants that were shut down, and that if claimant had had its uh, way, they would have fallen very obviously outside the cohort of those plants that would, uh, were allowed to continue. <coughs> Indeed, had Krummel been allowed to continue, one could argue that the other plants that were shut down would have had a very good reason to say they had been discriminated because their, um, they were treated differently than Krummel despite Krummel's obvious pro problems. <coughs> you will also remember the next slide showing you the distribution of nuclear power plants in Germany and their importance for the grid. I explained in the opening two weeks ago that grid stability could not be impacted by Krummel and Brunsbüttel because they had not been running and therefore shutting them off did not pose a problem to the uh, stability of the grid. Indeed, had they been allowed to run, given their frequent sudden failures, which obviously is something that for a grid agency is much harder to manage than, you know, plant X will have a revision in two months, so you know that you need X megawatt extra capacity on date 8 o'clock in the morning, that's easy to manage. 
In Kruml, it's from one second to the other, you have suddenly a scram, and then you have to make sure that the lights don't go out in Hamburg. So grid stability would indeed have been negatively impacted had Kruml been allowed to run. <coughs> you also remember the timeline of the Kruml incidents, and um, indeed that uh, it was only between 19 June and 4th of July 2009 that it had been running for the last time before Fukushima happened. You will also recall both from Mr. Graf's testimony and my opening the probabilistic studies, the likelihood of a co core melt accident. You also remember the discussion that in Mr. Graf's submission, power operations only for Krummel meant that the real risk was probably <coughs> bigger. You will also remember from the closing the pictures of the fire and the description of the incident which so closely resembled what had happened in Chernobyl. And you heard Clayman say this morning, well, why didn't Germany react in, relation to, in reaction to Chernobyl and switch them on off in 86? I, I remember it from the opening. You do, but also uh, uh, Clayman said this closing. this morning again. Right. I, mean, I, I, I thought you were referring to the fires. Uh, the fire was in the opening, but uh, Clayman's assertion that accusing Germany why it hadn't shut down nuclear uh, power immediately after Chernobyl, that was what I was addressing. Well, the difference was that you may call it, um, uh, well, let me, uh, let me just put it in the timely perspective. Um, this was in 86 towards the end of the uh, Soviet Union, when uh, at least in the West, and I'm, I'm certainly not going to, to say anything negative about the scientists in the Eastern Bloc, which are very well educated people and responsible people, but there was a certain perception in the West that uh, communism bred a certain amount of slop uh, sloppiness, which was probably why it wasn't taking as a game changer for switching off. What indeed Germany did was to implement further safety requirements. But the fact that Fukushima happened in a high technology state and 40 years later, 30 years later than Chernobyl had an, had an impact. In the 1980s, and I'm sure we are all, in our, uh, all old enough to recall that, Nuclear power plants weren't the only nuclear threat that was around. Um, nu when we were talking about nuclear threats at the time, and I remember that even in when I was in elementary school discussing the Pershing II um, uh, and the uh, NATO Doppelbeschluss, as, as the Germans call it, we had a different perception of nuclear risk at the time. But let's go back to the fires. <coughs> And I've pointed you to, to the news article. But we also heard p Mr. Kloster's testimony. <coughs> and he described the fire in Krummel as, I believe the fire in Krummel in 2007 was a unique event. There are no comparable cases where images of burning transformers and clouds of smoke above a nuclear power plant <laughs> that were broadcasted globally I do not know anything about similar events. Smoke and gases went into the control center. The personnel was affected. This was a very unique event. Smoke in the control center of a nuclear power plant. The control center, and you remember that fr also from the discussions with claimants experts, is the heart of the plant. If there is smoke in the control room, that is a highly dangerous situation. And you will find Dr. Kloster's full testimony at transcript 481 to 19. Then he talked about the cracks in the valves. That's transcript 482, lines 4 to 22. I refer to the cracks and the deficits in the pipelines and the fixtures, and I've already referred to that. In nuclear technology, it is not acceptable to have cracks present in pipes or fixtures. This is part of a preventative culture of safety that when issues such as these are found, that they are repaired. 
I will uh, skipping a bit. Nuclear power is a high-risk technology, and we may not even have the most minor deficits when it comes to security. 482 lines 4 and 22. He then explains, that's 483, 1 to 12, cracks in pipes and valves tend to grow. You are never sure how far or how fast these cracks can grow, and based on this, it is always necessary, if you find something like that, you fix the problems that you replace them to a safe condition. Now, this is marked markedly different when you hear Mr. Klein speak about that. Initial cracks were de detected with a maximum length and depth of about a thumbnail, which <coughs> doesn't sound like a micro crack to me if I look m at my own rather small thumb. And this phenomenon became apparent at rather a few locations, but there was only one single instance where it actually pen penetrated the wall and led to a dripping leakage. And then he complains the authority at the time forced us to take all of these welding seams, in total 64, taking them out and replacing them. And then I skip a bit, he says, I think would have been inconceivable in the US. That's 388.17-21 and 389.5-13. Now, why am I using the French word une fuite, c'est normal? Because, indeed, I heard this um, from a French plumber when I was living for four years in Paris. And I can tell you that the security culture for plumbing is very similar in France to the security culture as to cracks and leakage portrayed by Mr. Klein. And I can very well understand uh, Dr. Kloster's reaction that also leakages and cracks of the size of the thumbnail should be replaced and repaired because that was exactly the same position that I took vis-a-vis -vis my landlord in Paris, the letter to no avail, unfortunately. Dr. Klosters also reported another event, and you remember that that is uh, transcript 486, line 17 to 22, and 487, 1 to 15, where he explains that the authority had information of an unusual event, that they knew something was wrong, and he explains we debated for weeks with the operators to conduct the site visit. The operator refused to. You would also recall that above that quote, <coughs> he explains that they didn't even demand a shutdown of the plant, but just asked that it would be reduced in its um, capacity, not running at full steam, so that the radiation would be less and people could actually go there and have a look. But Vattenfall did not do that. And he explains further, and I recommend that you read this again um, at your leisure when you review the transcripts, that's 487 lines 40, uh, 16 to 22 and 488 1 to 11, what was found when finally um, a site visit could be conducted. <laughs> and what was uh, seen was that a um, head spray cooling system had exploded and I recall that um, Dr. Klosters described it as it looks like an open banana, it's really a terrifying issue, uh, image. And he is right. Um, this, is, uh, this is really something. Um, and uh, apparently, normal in Vattenfall's world. You've also seen from the, clo uh, from the opening the corroding barrels in Krümmel. You also recall that Eon expressed its deepest concerns in our, what is now R238, a letter from Eon CEO to Vattenfall, and then in the shareholder meeting, and again, I recall, I refer you again to C8. 
the criminals articles of association, a shareholders meeting has to be called if one shareholder wants it and has to deal with all me uh, things more than 250,000 and requires unanimity. In, in a protocol to the shareholders meeting of 15 July 2009, R199, E.ON speculated if this was a matter of intent. Vorsatz, which is another word for sabotage. And Dr. Klosters also juxtaposed the safety culture in his, direct in his testimony when asked by the tribunal of E.ON and Vattenfall. And this is a transcript 485 5 to 22 and 486.1. And he says there, on the one hand is the E.ON company. They are very preventative. They do a lot of preventative maintenance. And this meant that the plant ran without severe issues. On the other hand, in Vattenfall, it happened very differently. And he continues. 486, line 2 to 16. And looking at this, nobody was surprised that the plants run by Vattenfall had downtime or outages that were not observed at E.ON. I have for your reference, and I will not speak to them now, the excerpts of the Aftenblatt article in which the Deputy Prime Minister of Sweden and the Minister for Enterprise and Energy, that's what he was at the, same, at the time, of Vattenfall AB's sole shareholder stated that the confidence in the company had been seriously shaken and also that, quote, we don't want to risk our assets in Sweden in case of an accident in Germany, which was why Vattenfall AB <coughs> dissolved the control agreement. In order to answer the tribunal's question 11a, claimants would have had to show, and they didn't, which other plant should have been shut down from a safety perspective. That this other plant, which should have been selected, would not have discriminated against the other boiling water reactors of the construction line 69 that this selected plant would not have affected grid stability. They would also have had to show when KKK would have been scheduled for shutdown and to whom KKK would have transferred unused vol volumes. And also, and lastly and more importantly, that this alternative choice was so obvious that the choice of cru uh, choosing Krummel instead over that other plant would have been so obviously that the legislators' margin of appreciation would have been exceeded. There is no such other plant. And actually, claimants in their closings didn't even suggest it because they knew they would fail with that argument. They just argued, well, that criminal run, and without, even after being prompted by the tribunal, to address the question of the merit order, the effect of having another nuclear power plant on the net, well, until the next transformer failure, obviously, how that would have um, impacted Vattenfall's 92% conventional portfolio. I would now turn to 11B, um, unless the tribunal or David would want a break. I see you nodding behind my... my I'm sorry? Actually, and nodding. nodding, nodding. Nice. All right, uh, Good. shall we break for 15 minutes? Absolutely. Okay, recess 15 minutes.